he's going to talk about front end ops, which is basically um, all the things that you do when you play the game operation. Yep. Great. Alex Sexton, ladies and gentlemen. I just realized uh, now that I'm close up, I, a lot of people don't have this perspective, but I think Adam's hat is just a hamburger? This is, oh, this is a, an embroidered hamburger. It's a buttermilk biscuit. A buttermilk biscuit. It's a real, this is a real baseball team <laughs> from, from Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> All right. Um, OK. I'm going to be talking about front end ops, uh, which has a lot to do with operation. I wrote an article on Smashing Magazine in, on June 11th, 2013, and it did pretty well. Uh, they liked it, I liked it, some other people liked it. Mostly I liked the ebooks uh, guy that pops out behind that tab. He's really cute. Uh, I don't know, ebooks tab mascot. So, under a year later, we did Front End Ops Conf 2014. That was fun. It's like 250, 300 people showed up. And my biggest contribution was mostly the name, uh, which is pretty big, though. So, you know, the name of the conference. Naming things is hard. It's uh, one of the hardest problems in computer science. Uh, and front end ops is not the first thing that I named. I have a few other words that stuck that I'd like to share with you. The first is regressive enhancement. It's a lot like progressive enhancement. I define regressive enhancement as like if you were to make the experience worse in IE6 in order to force people to upgrade, like you make all the text blurry or like shaky or something like that, that's regressive enhancement. Um, that's much better than progressive enhancement, uh, unless you work for the filament group, in which case I redact everything I just said. Um, other people have different words. Uh, polyfill, I did not invent polyfill. I believe that was Remy Sharp. Uh, I did invent polyfill though, which is just as important. Uh, I, I called a polyfill a polyfill for a not yet standardized API. And I thought it was a funny joke to write on Twitter until the W3C standardized it as the real word that they use <laughs> for polyfills <laughs> for not yet standard APIs, though they spell it wrong. Uh, I'm going to have to file an issue. Uh, some of my other attempts uh, were not as successful. Parlay fill is uh, betting that a future API will exist. And I'm not really sure what a Molly fill is, but the tweens are really into them these days. Anyways, <laughs> front end ops. This name seems to be sticking all right, so let's say that this one works. Uh, this isn't really a technical talk. I really like to do technical talks and go deep into code, and so it's a little bit hard for me to, to give these types of uh, kind of convince you talks, but I really want to convince you that you're missing out on a whole swath of development that's really important. Lon's talk yesterday, for instance, is a, a very good example of an actual front end ops talk to, to get down to the deep, dirty uh, details of how to actually do front end ops, but I kind of want to convince you that you should even consider it to begin with because for some reason, we're all crazy and have been missing out on about half of what the rest of the development world does. Uh, first, I tried to call it FEO. Uh, it kind of sounds like SEO, and that was cool. And you could have like FEO, what are FEO, SEO consultants and SEO blogs and stuff like that. So FEO fit really well. And then my friend who speaks Spanish told me that it meant ugly, which uh, FEO is ugly. Anyways, FE Ops is maybe the better way to say it. So FE Ops is good. It reminded me of Iron, too. Uh, and Iron Ops is super catchy. IronOps.org or .net or something would be really good. George IRR Martin ruined Iron for me. Uh, but I, I, Iron Price uh, is good. Yeah, that's the bad joke. So what is front end ops? That's most people's first question, especially this very rude gentleman on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> uh, whatever. That guy's, he was, he got meaner after that. I, just, <laughs> I asked, uh, well, I told, I told John Edgar, the digital ocean rep yesterday, uh, that I was talking about front end ops. And I said, do you know, have you heard what it is? I was just wondering how widely spread it is. Uh, and he said, yeah, it's some weird terms you invented to describe things that don't exist. <laughs> so I'd like to officially thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring Jake Raycon as well as alexsexton.com, and I have no negative things to say about John Edgar or DigitalOcean. Yeah. And I'd like to continue getting free credits. 
So someone actually did write an article right after I wrote my Smashing Matter article, uh, and I highlighted the section that's uh, kind of uh, sub-tweety, sub-bloggy, I guess. Uh, it goes, uh, there's a lengthy article doing the rounds from Smashing Magazine describing a semi-mythical super developer who can deploy code anywhere, test anything, automate package management, and compile code assets like her life depended on it. And that was cool, and that's kind of true. And I know it's semi-mythical, but it's not semi-mythical because it's hard. It's semi-mythical because no one does it. And they're, uh, that's fine, but it's really easy. This is here are the four commands for deploy code anywhere, test anything, automate package management, compile code assets. Boom. More importantly, uh, that's the whole point. Serving web pages is really, really, really hard. And there's a lot of steps. Uh, one of my favorite tweets uh, is from Greg Brockman. He said, um, I should have just put it in the slide. It would be much easier than remembering the tweet. Greg Brockman on June 12, 2011, uh, at 4.27 PM, wrote, uh, web development is uh, just increasingly uh, complicated ways of concatenating strings together. Uh, and, and I like that uh, a lot uh, because it's so simple, but we keep adding new layers of complexity and new systems and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to add some more for you. Uh, but that's why we have conferences for this stuff. That's why we talk about it. That's why we write blogs about it. We don't have conferences for things that are easy. And so I'd like to tell you about some conferences that don't exist because they're too easy. HTML Entity Conf is one of those conferences. And then Easy Like Sunday Morning Conf also doesn't exist. So front end ops is the collection of things that you can do to make serving web pages easier. Uh, which is uh, the opposite of what that person talked about with this semi-mythical super developer. Uh, you write things once, and then it becomes a lot easier to do the right thing. Uh, you can serve them quickly, correctly. It's the act of building in performance and developer happiness by default instead of as an afterthought. You can make computers do the work instead of doing the work yourself crappily every time. So you can focus on your product, and so can your users. The way I decided to come up with front end ops, because naturally we've been doing a lot of this stuff long before I put a, a stupid name uh, for it, was I wrote an article about how uh, Bizarre Voice, uh, a lot of the stuff in Firebird that, that Lon was talking about yesterday, was uh, doing our deployments. And I talked about scout files and all these optimizations we were doing for caching and, and things like that. And this person said, uh, in a comment on my blog, with all due respect, may I ask if you actually enjoy your job? I'm a dev, and I do enjoy using tech to do stuff to a point. If your role is to squeeze every last second of performance out of your app, then yeah, all this stuff must be cool. But if you're a coder doing something else and then come back to all of this as well, then wow, I don't know how you haven't gotten mad already. I'd be sick to the stomach if I had to do all of this in addition to my usual work. Uh, so th this is where th this sentiment was like, that ah, kind of. Like, he's right. Uh, I, I can't blame them from, for thinking this way. But, uh, but I, it's really sad to me, because this is really enjoyable to me. And it's absolutely what I want to be working on. And I think everyone should do it. And so I wrote Front End Ops to say, like, hey, this is, this is actually not that crazy. Um, and, and once you get far enough along, Front end ops uh, benefits the people who don't have time to think about this stuff. So you, you, you build in these tools. Uh, you, you do a bunch of the stuff that we're going to talk about in a second. And that person who doesn't have time to think about caching and deployment and testing and things like that doesn't have to every time, because that's what computers are for. And so it's about making high quality applications without having to every time uh, worry about all those things individually. Lots of folks agree. Uh, conference was successful, a lot of you showed up. So uh, let's talk about it. So, so what really is it? Uh, here's my very simple pie chart uh, for an application and everything else. Um, and front end ops is everything except for the actual code that runs your application. So it's your build tools, it's your testing, it's uh, your monitoring and your discussions, it's your documentation. It's literally everything except for the code that runs on the client or somewhere else. I guess if it's front-end ops, it'd have to be the client. So I know all of you read the article uh, in great detail, but I wanted to refresh your memory in case it's so familiar that it's beginning to lose its true meaning. Uh, one of the lines says, uh, front-end ops engineers are the bridge between an application's intent and an application's reality. I think a lot of times when you work on uh, code for you know, like a year, 
you have this very good picture and you have these initial demos and they all work super well. And then if you're actually a user and come into that application, that's uh, much less impressive of an experience than you had in your head. And a lot of times that's for performance problems or testing problems or compatibility problems. And these are all things that we want to try to solve uh, in an automated way. So I talk a lot about a single engineer in the article. Uh, and at the end, I kind of uh, um, say that, say that uh, this could be a team of engineers, right? Bizarre Voice has uh, that team that Lon's on now. That they, they work entirely on these tools and entirely on these performance metrics. But if you're a smaller team or if you don't have buy-in from your manager, it could absolutely be like your Friday task or um, something that you at least can get uh, tasks in there to, to do uh, more often. So it doesn't have to be a full engineer that you hire as a front end ops engineer, but it's something that you should consider and should be as highly valued as actually putting in features in your app because it, it supports those features. So why do we want all this stuff? And this is probably the crux of whether someone agrees with me or whether they don't. Uh, and the reason we need front end ops is because we are all collectively insane as front end engineers. In the front end world, uh, we accept running absolutely blind production applications with a scarily natural ease, right? Uh, how, how many of you have error logging turned on on your applications like the websites that you build? Can you raise your hand? So that's maybe, we're looking at 3 to 3.1% of the people in the room have error logging, right? So, so if, you, if you talk to someone who runs an API for an application uh, and you're like, hey, how's the API running? And they're like, I don't know, it's in production. Uh, <laughs> like that's insane, but that's exactly what we're doing. We have no idea what, what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, oh, this code is running on other people's machines, so it's no longer my problem. Uh, it's, it's kind of the, the thought, right? Like it's worked on my machine. Uh, <laughs> and whenever people finally turn on error reporting, so the people who raised your hand, do you remember the first day you turned on error reporting? Do you remember being shocked and in, in horror, horrified of how many people were running into actual user errors with the code you wrote? Like, it's, it's insane. Uh, that was hundreds and thousands per day uh, that you just would never know about. And so uh, this is how I feel, uh, this slide, uh, is how I feel we <laughs> all collectively are to the world. Um, this is probably my favorite picture of all time. <laughs> it just gets, the more you look at it, the more it becomes appropriate. Uh, anyways, so, so why now? Why is this only important now? Uh, why haven't we been doing this for a long time? And that's because application logic is being deferred to the client side and we're doing rich internet applications and JavaScript is coming to its own um, and I think that's all good. I think we could have been doing this for a long time, but it's something that uh, we need a lot of these tools uh, because we did so little client side work before, but our methods haven't caught up with the, our eagerness to build rich uh, applications. So we have all these things on the server side. We have performance testing. People use New Relic and they use all these different things. Skylight just came out for Rails and, and people monitor API request times and all these things and stuff that we don't do. No performance testing. Uh, most people don't do error logging, which is insane. It's probably like the first thing you should ever implement. You should figure out how your application is breaking for your users on a daily basis thousands of times. And lifecycle logging is something to help developers know how your application works. If you, if you download like old PHP code from 1996, it has lifecycle logging and you can turn on the logging levels to see exactly what order things are running in and how it runs and what context things are in and then uh, it's 10 years later and JavaScript people still don't do that. Ember actually, uh, I was impressed with Ember's use of lifecycle logging for the record. Uh, measurement over time is also a really important part about front-end ops. It is uh, the key into seeing the change. So the difference in all of these metrics that you're logging is actually what you want to know. So the raw value of my site loads in two seconds or five seconds or 300 milliseconds isn't that interesting, but that, that commit that I made changed it 50 milliseconds either direction is actually the more interesting number. So I want to see a diff of exactly what caused my slowdown. So front-end engineer, uh, front-end ops engineer 
in short, enables long-term progress. It makes an application outlast the people who originally devised it and outlast the features that were originally devised for it, which is pretty important unless you want to keep rewriting your apps over and over again. So performance is the foundation on which a user experience is built. You can have the coolest user interactions, you can have the sweetest libraries, you can have everything that you want and, and be Apple, but um, if it's slow, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I think there's a saying called, uh, that goes, uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and I, I changed that, and uh, uh, a UX in the DOM is worth two on the wire. I think it's more appropriate for us. Uh, getting your user experience to uh, your users is, is extremely important and showing them, them quickly. So speed is the, the metric that we measure by. There are different types of speed when we talk about front-end ops. There's the speed of the actual application that like you're talking about. There's the speed of the tools that you use and there's the speed of the de development which is kind of like developer happiness. The, how fast your team is able to iterate on the application is actually another form of speed. There's also uh, speed three. Uh, this, I did not actually make this sweet Photoshop. Uh, I just searched for Speed 3 and someone had, I guess they were speculating on whether a Speed 3 would come out. I think it's still possible. So all of these, uh, all of these things uh, can be tracked, uh, but it's really important to make sure you know how to read the data that you're tracking. So let's go through how to affect each one of these three different types of speeds minus uh, the Keanu Reeves version. Um, and I also intentionally made this doubly parenthetical because I read through the article when I was making these slides and it turns out I use a lot of parentheses. So the speed of the app is the first topic that, that we kind of brought up. So here's how to speed up your app in five simple steps. If you'd like the complicated uh, good version, uh, see Lon's talk from yesterday. So step one is forget everything you know because it's wrong. Uh, CDNs, concatenation, gzipping, parse time, blocking, rendering. Uh, all you have to do is go check out some issues on like the HTML5 boilerplate project to see the religious holy war of uh, performance incantations that people uh, swear work and have no measurements for. Uh, so I thought Lonsock was really good on actually diving deep into how to measure that stuff and how to affect the change. Uh, Paul Irish also has a keynote from FluentConf and from Frontend OpsConf that you, sh you could watch and it would be a uh, pretty good uh, uh, reason. So the network is, is almost always a slow part. You know, if you're in a part of your application that's actually running and chugging and, and scrolling performance can be huge things, but the network is by far the slowest part, so probably focus on, on your network. Uh, also probably read Ilya's book. These are very concrete steps that start with probably. Uh, read Ilya's book on browser networking if you want, ever want to understand performance. Uh, Ilya is uh, the master of this, uh, so do that. And then step four is measure and step five is measure. So that's forget everything, probably network, Illy's book, and then measure twice. So how can you measure? Chrome DevTools uh, is pretty sweet in measurement. Uh, actually, Firefox this morning released a bunch of uh, cool new measurement tools. Uh, I guess it was in Germany, so I don't know if it was, it was probably afternoon there. Um, but they're uh, really good ways to manually measure, and you can actually export a lot of this information and, and graph it yourself and, and uh, store it in whatever database system you're using. Uh, but the limiting factor of your system should be the speed of light. That, that's uh, well, if you have fiber. Uh, so Austin and Kansas City have Google Fiber. Everyone else um, give it like 15 years. Um, but the uh, you shouldn't be introducing um, bottlenecks in your application that aren't caused by external factors. Uh, it's pretty easy, or it's pretty hard, but uh, hopefully should be easy in the future to write applications that uh, don't have unnecessary performance bottlenecks, and we can actually just get things as fast as we possibly can, uh, and fiber would help that. So I want to show some theoretical graphs of ways of looking at data, um, and some of these graphs, a lot of them actually exist in various applications, but uh, breaking down data in ways that you may not normally do it. A lot of times we want to, uh, measure the performance of our website. So we have a graph that just has performance over time. It's not actually that useful because there's so much data wrapped into like performance over time, like uh, the onload event or something like that, which is a bad metric. And, and there's so many different variables that that's actually not that useful to see you know, web page load time over time. You, you want to break it down even further. So for instance, you could break it down to by device. You know, an, uh, an OS X device is going to render a page a lot faster than a BlackBerry device. and so. Uh, having those two averaging each other out 
uh, inside of your graph is not actually uh, that interesting. Uh, and it may actually hurt your assumptions. Uh, things like where people are loading your application from could be a really interesting thing because of the latency uh, in connection that they have uh, to that. And that, so that'll hide more insights. Um, you could have Wi-Fi and 4G and 3G. Uh, potatoes are actually faster than Edge, so they're uh, <laughs> represented here. But uh, a lot of people don't realize how information gets hidden inside these measurement things. So there's a lot of people who are actually smart on this, but I have a single example. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is extremely important, and it happens in much more subtle ways. But I, I want to make sure that people are aware that if you don't break down, if you, if you don't limit the number of variables that are in your measurements, it, it actually could hurt uh, your assumptions. Um, so uh, take this distribution of load time. Uh, these look like seconds on the bottom. Let's assume that it's like a speed index divided by 100, because speed index is what you should be using. Um, and then, uh, so let's say that this is desktop and this is mobile, right? So mobile devices are a little slower, and they're probably on 3G or 4G, whereas desktop devices have faster processors, and they're likely on Wi-Fi or, or hardwire or something like that. And so you have these two lines, and so uh, pretty clear, like this is where, you know, you know bell curve, or these aren't bell curves, but uh, pretty clear where the most people come in there at whatever, two seconds, and then most people come in at three seconds for the mobile devices. And that's actually pretty interesting. You know that like on desktop, two seconds is what it is. On mobile, uh, three seconds is what it is. So these are very distinct loading curves. Like you have people who have fast mobile devices and fast connections in cities, and you have people who have rural connections and worse devices, right? And so this uh, average actually works really well. But if you didn't split these two things apart, this is what you would see. Uh, this is the graph of both of these uh, together, number of devices loading in this set. So it's the exact opposite graph that you want. The, the least interesting part of this graph is the 2.5 second mark, and that's exactly what we're saying is the most important part of this graph. Um, and so that's bad, and you don't want to do that. So if I had to pick uh, one part that was the most important to front end ops, it would be all of it. The number two would be measurement. Uh, so how you do measurement and how you read in the measurement uh, is, is the most important. So once, once you can understand uh, the measurements that you're taking, uh, it's pretty simple to devise plans. If, if you saw Alon Sock yesterday, uh, you, you could see after he built his model, it was actually really clear um, that he should switch uh, uh, to specific. Uh, it was really simple for him that once he built this model that he could have a very clear path to, to speeding up his app. And it worked and he tested it and it was good. Uh, so old carpentry industry guys with suspenders on say measure twice, optimize once. So make a dashboard. Uh, you want to always have this data in front of you and you always want to notice when things change. So the difference in data is more interesting than the data itself. So the change in data, the, the delta, is, is what you're looking for. So um, you should probably be testing things against production or something that exactly mimics production, which is more or less impossible. Um, it's not that interesting if you have a local server in your office that you hit local devices against uh, running in a different mode with different variables in non-real world situations, um, though that is still better than what you all do right now, which is nothing. Um, so you can put uh, lots of things in dashboard. The speed index over time, uh, and then you can draw where commits happen in the speed index, and then you can watch the speed index go up or down, and then you can say, show me the diff of what caused this problem, this slowdown to happen. Um, oh, I already said that. So this is a, I forgot what it was, uh, yeah, speedcurve.com. Um, the guy out of New Zealand uh, is building this. He, he actually, since uh, I, I screenshotted this, I told him, I was like, I really wish this was speed index and not like, on load numbers. And he switched it, and it was good. Uh, so good job to him. Uh, but yeah, so speed curve is, uh, they use web page tests on the background. You could use web page tests as an API, a CLI, some docs. Patrick uh, Meenan at Google is working on it. It's, it's awesome. Uh, it'll load your page in a real browsers and tell you how fast they are. Um, you can put your page weight over time also. Uh, you can put the gzipped and ungzipped page weights. Uh, you can break it down by file type and say all of our CSS is 500 megabytes and all of our JavaScript is 2.2 gigabytes. And that's how big our application is in general. Uh, you can have requests over time. Uh, and 
and uh, you know, you're using Semver to release your app and you hit 1.0 of your application, you can say, all right, it now takes uh, manager approval to add any requests to your app. So if this goes up, test fails, um, unless you get uh, you know, tech lead approval to add a new request. Otherwise, you're, you're free to take requests out. Uh, something like that would be like awesome uh, rules in your organization to help you deal with uh, the measurement of these things. Errors, uh, there are a lot of companies, like it's, it's actually pretty uh, uh, saturated space. These are Sentry and Airbrake and New Relic all have a piece of JavaScript you can put on your page and it'll just send errors to some place. If you need to be secure, I think Sentry can run inside your VPN and get past all that stuff and it's all good and you can go and look and see how many people are having terrible times using your application. So the build over time uh, is really interesting. This kind of gets us into that third type of speed which I call developer happiness, speed of tools. So the build tools are really important. Um, uh, there's a lot of specifics here so hopefully I can be brief. So rule number one is the time between making a change and seeing it in your app much, must approach zero. So if you think about like Brett Victor's talk uh, on how he wants to be editing code and then seeing the changes that he's editing the code immediately, um, that's the type of world we want to be in because the more you divorce your changes from what you're able to see in the application, the uh, less excited your coworkers are to build good things and they just assume things work. Uh, and then they don't log the errors when they don't work and then you all get fired. So never do anything twice. Uh, this is uh, a way to be fast. Uh, so this is another way of saying uh, cash rules everything around me. Uh, cream, get to this speed index. Um, so caches can be hard to manage. It's one of the other hard problems in computer science. I think we've hit two of uh, the five. Uh, that are hard. So feel free to do two things at the same time, but never do two things twice. So uh, the last type of speed, uh, the developer happiness stuff, um, is uh, spare no expense. Uh, do not uh, prioritize features over uh, your developer happiness. If you hate working on an application, those features will be much slower and much worse. Uh, so turn on every tool that could possibly help you. I see a lot of people just forego source maps. It takes like an extra seven seconds to configure Grunt to, to put out source maps. So uh, do that. Um, should be one easy command to get everything to work. If you want to watch something, it should be you know, Grunt watch or it should be Grunt serve or Grunt build. Uh, and they should be uh, really documented steps. If you have environment problems, you need random Python bindings or something like that, uh, Vagrant can be really helpful to make it to where the first time someone loads the readme of your page, they still only have to run Vagrant up and Grunt serve or something like that. Uh, turn on live reload. Uh, if you save me one refresh every time uh, that I make a change to my code, you save me about uh, 776,000 reloads per year which is nice. Uh, implement lifecycle logging. So Rebecca Murphy has a developer happiness talk from JSConf that you should all watch. Uh, these are very helpful optional console outputs. Uh, you, you can use console, um, what is it, console.info and you can nest them and it can be really nice. Uh, so more or less all this is is whenever you, you know, start in the view uh, object in your code, you say view is initializing and you might give it some data and then you can say, oh, this template is rendering, this template is completed rendering. And you get this log of exactly what's happening and then an error happens and you can see that it happened right between the template starting rendering and where the template ended rendering. And you know that, hey, my error must be in the template rendering. You know how you do that uh, right now? Uh, you're like, oh, crap, uh, my application doesn't work. So you put an alert on the first line and then you move it to the next place and you put it on that line and you move it to the next place until it stops alerting. This is that except for not insane. Uh, so set a calendar reminder to update your dependencies. Uh, if there's one thing that I've noticed from my teammates is that I'm the only one who cares about updating things. But I think it's, I think it's a good thing. I, I can be scary to update your dependencies but if you don't do it like, every two weeks or three weeks, then it will be too hard in the future. Oh, that, we are too far away, that will be hard. If you take you know, the five minutes to do it every Friday, it's pretty easy. Uh, this requires good tests though, so I encourage you to write good tests. Um, that's an easy one. Have a rigorous style guide. Uh, probably start with Rick Waldron's uh, style guide that he has online. What was that one called? 
idiomatic JS. Thanks, guys. Uh, so the one thing I would encourage is for you to use something like JSCS or JS Hint or as much as many possible tools as you can to have robots yell at pedantic things that you want the same in your application because you feel like a jerk every time someone sends you a pull request and you're like, hey, can you make the parentheses go one further space over? And so over time, you're like, ah, well, this person's already mad at me because I still haven't finished that feature I'm working on, so I'm not going to ask them to use double quotes instead of single quotes or vice versa. And then you're, you start feeling bad about things. So make robots be the pedantic jerk faces on your team so no one's feelings gets hurt other than uh, by Douglas Crockford. So if we take uh, care to build robust tools and uh, use front end ops to our advantage, uh, we can master less uh, and, and focus on users more, which is the exact goal of those people who are upset with the idea of front end ops. So hopefully people like Cosman uh, can be nicer. He, he's not going to watch this talk, but uh, other of you can, can have a good time uh, using front end ops. So uh, we can focus on measurement and maintainability and make good web applications. Thanks.